Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well, and welcome back to tonight's second half. Before we get into it, a couple links. As you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, and my merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. The links to Patreon and PayPal are in the description below. My merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1, 2, and 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeffrey Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, the links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support this channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe, click the like button, and please leave a comment. It really does help, and it does matter. And now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's get on with tonight's second half, shall we? Tonight I am going to share with you some proof, evidence, that the government or NWO or secret government or whoever you want to call them tried to stifle Admiral Byrd and his find, the great unknown. And it proves that the government has been trying to silence Anything that points to the paranormal, abnormal, supernatural for a long, long time. The greatest geographical discovery in human history. That enchanted continent in the sky, land of everlasting mystery. I'd like to see that land beyond the pole. That area beyond the pole is the center of the great unknown. Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd. The above two statements by the greatest explorer in modern times, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd of the United States Navy, cannot be understood nor make any sense according to the old geographical theories that the Earth is a solid sphere with a fiery core on which both North and South Poles are fixed points. If such was the case, and if Admiral Byrd flew for 1,700 and 2,300 miles respectively across North and South Poles to an icy and snowbound lands that lie on the other side, whose geography is fairly well known, it would be incomprehensible for him to make such a statement, referring to this territory on the other side of the Poles as the Great Unknown. Also, you'd have no reason to use such a term as land of everlasting mystery. Bird was not a poet, and what he described was what he observed from his airplane during his Arctic flight 1,700 miles beyond the North Pole. He reported by radio that he saw below him not ice and snow, but land areas consisting of mountains, forests, green vegetation, lakes, and rivers, and in the underbrush saw a strange animal resembling a mammoth found frozen in an arctic ice. Evidently, he had entered a warmer region than the icebound territory that extends from the pole to Siberia. If Byrd had this region in mind, he would have no reason to call it the Great Unknown, since it could be reached by flying across the pole to the other side of the arctic region. The only way that we can understand Byrd's enigmatical statements is if we discard the traditional concept of the formation of the earth and entertain an entirely new one according to which is Arctic and Antarctic extremities are not convex but concave and that Byrd entered into the polar concavities when he went beyond the poles. In other words, he did not travel across the poles to the other side, but entered into the polar concavity or depression, which, as we shall see, opens to the Howell interior earth, the home of planet, animal, and human life enjoying a tropical climate. This is the great unknown to which Byrd had referenced when he made this statement, and not the ice a snowbound area on the other side of the North Pole extending to the upper reaches of Siberia. 
The new geographical theory presented for the first time makes bird strange, enigmatical statements comprehensible and shows that the great explorer was not a dreamer, as may appear to one who holds the old geographic theory. Bird had entered entirely new territory, which was unknown because it was not on any map. And it was not on any map because all maps have been made on the basis of the belief that the earth is spherical and solid. Since nearly all lands on this solid sphere have been explored and recorded by polar explorers, there could not be room on such maps for a territory that Admiral Byrd discovered and which he called the Great Unknown, unknown because not on any map. It was an area of land as large as North America. This mystery can only be solved if we accept the basic concept of the Earth's formation presented in a book and supported by observations of Arctic explorers, which will be cited here. According to this new revolutionary concept, the Earth is not a solid sphere, but is hollow, with openings at the poles, and Admiral Byrd entered these openings for a distance of some 4,000 miles during his 1947 and 1956 Arctic and Antarctic expedition. The great unknown to which Byrd referred was the iceless land area inside the polar concavities opening to the hollow interior of the earth. If this concept is correct, as we shall attempt to prove, then both North and South Poles cannot exist, since they would be in mid-air, in the center of the polar openings, and would not be on the earth's surface. This view was first presented by an American writer, William Reed, in a book, Phantom of the Poles, published in 1906, soon after Admiral Perry claimed to have discovered the North Pole, and denying that he really did. In 1920, another book was published, written by Marshall Gardner, called A Journey to the Earth's Inner, or Have the Poles Really Been Discovered, making the same claim. Strangely, Gardner had no knowledge of Reed's book, and came to his own conclusions independently. Both Reed and Gardner claimed that the earth was hollow, with openings at the poles, and that in its interior lives a vast population of millions of inhabitants, composing of an advanced civilization. This is probably the great unknown to which Admiral Byrd referred. To repeat, Byrd could not have had any part of the earth's known surface in mind when he spoke of the great unknown, but rather a new hitherto unknown land area, free from ice, snow, with green vegetation, forests, and animal life that exists nowhere on Earth's surface but inside the polar depression, receiving its heat from the hollow interior, which has a higher temperature than the surface, with which it communicates only on a basis of this conception can we understand Admiral Byrd's statements. In January 1956, Admiral Byrd led another expedition to the Antarctic and there penetrated for 2,300 miles beyond the South Pole. The radio announcement at this time, January 13, 1956, said on January 13, members of the United States expedition penetrated a land extent of 2,300 miles beyond the Pole. The flight was made by Rear Admiral George Defeck of the United States Navy Air Unit. The word beyond is very significant and will be puzzling to those who believe in the old conception of the solid earth. It would then mean the region on the other side of the Antarctic continent and the ocean beyond, and would not be a vast new territory, nor would his expedition that found this territory be the most important expedition in history of the world. The geography of Antarctica is fairly well known, and Admiral Byrd has not added any significant to our knowledge of the Antarctic continent. If this is the case, then why should he make such an apparently wild and unsupported statement, especially in view of his high standing as a rear admiral of the United States Navy and his reputation as a great explorer? 
This enigma is solved when we understand the new geographic theory of a howl earth, which is the only way we can see any sense into Admiral Byrd's statements and not consider him as a visionary who saw mirages in the polar regions, or at least imagined he did. After returning from his Antarctic expedition on March 13, 1956, Byrd remarked, The present expedition has opened up a vast new land. The word land is very significant. He could not have referred to any part of the Antarctic continent, since none of it consists of land, and all of it of ice. And besides, its geography is fairly well known, and Byrd did not make any noteworthy contribution to the Antarctic geography, as other explorers did, who left their names as memorials in the geography of the area. If Byrd discovered a vast new area in Antarctic, he would claim it for the United States, and it would be named after him, just as would be the case if his 1,700-mile flight beyond the North Pole was over the Earth's surface between the Pole and Siberia. But we find no such achievements to credit of this great explorer, nor did he leave his name in the Antarctic or Arctic geography to the extent that this statement about discovering a vast new land would indicate if his Antarctic expedition opened up a new immense region of ice on a frozen continent in Antarctica, it would not be appropriate to use the word land, which means an iceless region similar to that over which Bird flew for 1,700 miles beyond the North Pole, which had green vegetation, forests, and animal life. We may therefore conclude that his 1956 expedition for 2,300 miles beyond the South Pole was over similar iceless territory not recorded on any map and not over any part of the Antarctic continent. The next year, in 1957, before his death, Byrd called this land beyond the South Pole, not ice, on the other side of the South Pole, that enchanted continent in the sky, land of everlasting mystery. He could not have used this statement if he referred to part of the icy continent of Antarctica, that lies on the other side of the South Pole. The words everlasting mystery obviously refer to something else. They refer to the warmer theory not shown on any map that lies inside the South Pole opening leading to the Howell interior of the Earth. The expression that enchanted continent in the sky obviously refers to the land area and not ice. Mirrored in the sky which acts as a mirror a strange phenomenon observed by many polar explorers who speak of a island in the sky or water sky, depending or whether the sky of polar regions reflects land or light. If Bird saw the reflection of water or ice, he would not use the word continent, nor call it an enchanted continent. It was enchanted because according to accepted geographical conceptions, this continent which Bird saw reflecting in the sky, where water globules act as a mirror for a surface below, could not exist. We shall now quote from Ray Palmer, editor of Flying Saucer magazine and a leading expert on flying saucers, who is of the opinion that Admiral Bird's discoveries in the Antarctic and Arctic regions offer an explanation of the origin of flying saucers which he believes do not come from other planets, but from Howell interior Earth, where exists an advanced civilization far in advance of us, using flying saucers for aerial travel coming to the outside of the Earth through the polar openings. Palmer explains his views as follows. How well known is the Earth? Is there any area on the Earth that can be regarded as a possible origin of flying saucers? There are two. The two major areas of importance are the Antarctic and the Arctic. Admiral Byrd's two flights over both poles prove that there is a strangeness about the shape of the Earth in both polar areas. Byrd flew to the North Pole, but did not stop there and turned back, but went for 1,700 miles beyond that. 
and then retraced his course to his Arctic base due to his fuel supply running low. As progress was made beyond the pole point, iceless land, and lakes, mountains, covered in trees, and even monstrous animals resembling mammoth of antiquity was seen moving through the underbrush, and all this was reported via radio by the plane occupants for almost all of the 1,700 miles the plane flew over land, mountains, trees, lakes, and rivers. What was this unknown land? Did Bird, in traveling due north, enter into a howl interior of the earth through the northern pole opening? Later, Bird's expedition went to the South Pole, and after passing it, went 2,300 miles beyond that. Once again, we have a we have penetrated an unknown and mysterious land which does not appear on today's maps. And once again, we find no announcement beyond the initial announcement of the achievement. And strangest of all, we find the world's millions absorbing the announcements and registering a complete blank in so far as curiosity is concerned. Here, then, are the facts. At both poles exist unknown and vast land areas, not in the least uninhabitable, extending distances which can only be called tremendous because they encompass an area larger than any known continent. The North Pole mystery land seen by Byrd and his crew is at least 1,700 miles across its traverse direction and cannot be conceived to be a narrow strip. It is an area perhaps as large as the entire United States. In the case of the South Pole, the land traversed beyond the pole included an area as big as the North America, perhaps the South Polar Continent. The flying saucers could come from these unknown lands beyond the poles, it is the opinion of the editor of Flying Saucer magazine that the existence of these lands cannot be disproved by anyone considering the facts of the two expeditions which have been outlined. If Rear Admiral Byrd claimed that his South Pole expedition was the most important expedition in history of the world, and if, after he returned from this expedition, he remarked, the present expedition has opened up a new vast land, it would be strange and inexplicable how such a great discovery of new land area as large as North America, comparable to Columbus's discovery of America, should have received no attention and have been almost totally forgotten today. But that nobody knew about it from the most ignorant to the most learned. The only rational explanation of this mystery is after the brief announcement in the American press based on Admiral Byrd's radio report. Further publicity was suppressed by the government in whose employ Byrd was working, and which had important political reasons why Admiral Byrd's historic discovery should not be made known to the world, for he had discovered two unknown land areas measuring a total of 4,000 miles across and probably as large as both North and South American continents. Since Byrd's planes turned back without reaching the end of his territory, not recorded on any map, evidently the United States government feared that some other government may learn about Byrd's discovery and conduct similar flights going much further into it than Byrd did, and perhaps claiming this land area as its own. Commenting on Byrd's statement, made in 1957, shortly before his death, in which he called the new territory he discovered beyond the poles, that enchanted continent in the sky, and land of everlasting mystery. Considering all this, is there any wonder that all nations of the world suddenly found the South Pole region, particularly, and the North Pole region, so intensely interesting? and important and have lodged explorations on a scale actually tremendous in scope. Palmer concludes that this new land beyond Bird's discovery, and which is not on any map, exists inside and not outside of the earth, since the geography of the outside is quite well known, whereas that of the inside is not. For that reason, Bird called it the great unknown after discussing the significance of the use of the term beyond the pole of bird instead 
of a crossed the pole to the other side of the Arctic and Antarctic region. Palmer concludes that what Bird referred to was the unknown land area inside the polar concavity and connecting with the warmer interior of the earth, which accounts for its green vegetation and animal life. It is unknown because it is not on the earth's outer surface and hence is not recorded on any map. In February of 47, Admiral Richard E. Byrd, the one man who has done the most to make the North Pole a known area, made the following statement. I'd like to see the land beyond the, the pole. The area beyond the pole is the center of the great unknown. Millions of people read this statement in their daily newspapers, and millions thrilled at Admiral's subsequent flight to the pole and to a point of 1,700 miles beyond it. Millions of the, heard the radio broadcast description of the flight, which was also published in newspapers. What land was it? Look at your map. Calculate the distance from all the known lands we have previously mentioned. Siberia, Spitsbergen, Alaska, Canada, Finland, Norway, Greenland, and Iceland, a good portion of them are all well within that 1,700-mile range, but none of them are within 200 miles of the pole. Bird flew over. No known land. He himself called it the Great Unknown. And great it is indeed. For after 1,700 miles over land, he was forced by gasoline shortage to return, and he had not yet reached the end. He should have been back to civilization, but he was not. He should have seen nothing but ice-covered oceans, or, at the very most, a partially open sea. Instead, he was over mountains covered with forests, forests incredible. The northernmost limit of the timberline is located well down into Alaska, Canada, and Siberia. North of that line, no trees grow. All around the North Pole, the trees do not grow within 1,700 miles of the pole. What have we here? We have a well-authenticated flight of Admiral Richard E. Byrd to a land beyond the pole that he so much wanted to see because it was the center of the great unknown, the center mystery. Apparently, he had his wish granted to its fullest, yet today nowhere is this mysterious land mentioned. Why? Was that 1947 flight fiction? Did all the newspapers lie? Did the radio from Bird's plane lie? No. Admiral Bird did fly beyond the pole. Beyond. What did the Admiral mean when he used that word? How is it possible to go beyond the pole? Let's consider this for a moment. Let us imagine that we are transported by some miraculous means to the exact point of the northern magnetic pole. We arrive here instantaneously, not knowing from which direction we came, and all we know is that we are, a we are to proceed from the pole to Spitzenbergen. But where is Spitzenbergen? Which way do we go? South, of course. But which south? All directions from north are south. This is actually a simple navigational problem. All expeditions to the pole, whether flown or by submarine, or on foot, have been faced with this problem. Either they must retrace their steps or discover which southerly direction is the correct one to their designation. Wherever it has been determined to be, the problem is solved by making a turn in any direction and proceeding approximately 20 miles. Then we stop, measure the stars, cal calculate with our compass reading, which no longer points straight down, but toward the north magnetic pole, and plot our course on the map, then it is a simple matter of then it is a simple matter to proceed proceed to Spitzenbergen by going south. Admiral Byrd did not follow this traditional navigational procedure. When he reached the pole he continued for seventeen hundred miles. To all intents and purpose, he continued on a northerly course after crossing the pole, and weirdly it stands on record that he succeeded, or he would not see the land beyond the pole, which to this day, if we are to scan the records of newspapers, books, radios, televisions, word of mouth, has never been revisited. 
that land on today's map cannot exist. But since it does, we can only conclude that today's maps are incorrect, incomplete, and do not represent the true picture of the Northern Hemisphere. Having thus located a great land mass in the north, not on any map today, a land which is the center of the great unknown, which can only be construed to imply that the 1,709 mile extent traversed by Bird is only a portion of it. Such an important discovery, which Bird called the most important in the history of the world, should have been known to everyone if information about it was not suppressed to such an extent, and it was almost completely forgotten until Gianni mentioned it in his book, Worlds Beyond the Poles, published in New York, 1959. Similarly, Gianni's book, for some strange reason, was not advertised by the publisher and remained unknown. At the end of the same year, 1959, Ray Palmer, editor of Flying Saucer magazine, gave publicity to Admiral Byrd's discovery, about which he learned in a copy of Gianni's book he read. He was so impressed that in December of that year, he published this information in his magazine which was for sale on newsstands throughout the United States. Then followed a series of strange incidents indicating that secret forces were at work to prevent the information contained in the December issue of Flying Saucer magazine derived from Gianni's book to reach the public. Who were these strange forces that have a special reason to suppress the release of information about Admiral Byrd's great discovery? of new land areas not on any map. Obviously, they are the same forces that suppress news release for information, except for the brief press notice after Byrd made his great discovery and before Gianni published the first public statement about it in many years in 1959, 12 years after the discovery was made. Palmer's announcement of Byrd's discovery in the Arctic and Antarctic was the first large-scale publicity since the time they were made and briefly announced, and so much more significant than Gianni's quotations and statements in his book that was not properly advertised and enjoyed a limited sale. For this reason, soon after the December 1959 issue of Flying Saucers was ready to mail to subscribers and placed on newsstands, it was mysteriously re removed from circulation, evidently by the same secret forces that suppressed the public release of this information in 1947. When the truck arrived to deliver the magazines from the printer to the publisher, no magazine were found in that truck. A phone call by the publisher, Mr. Palmer, to the printer resulted in his not finding any shipping receipt, providing proving statement has been made. Shipment has been made, excuse me. The magazines had been paid for. The publisher asked the printer return the plates to the press and run off more copies. But strangely, the plates were not available and were so badly damaged that no reprinting could be made. But where were thousands of magazines that had been printed and mysteriously disappeared? Why was there no shipping receipt? If it was lost and the magazines were sent the wrong address, that would they would turn up somewhere, but they didn't. As a result, 5,000 subscribers did not get their magazine. One distributor, who had received 750 copies to sell on his newsstand, was reported missing, and 750 magazines disappeared with him. These magazines were sent to him with a request that they be returned if not delivered. They did not come back, since the magazine disappeared completely several months later. It was republished and sent to subscribers. What did this magazine contain that caused it to be suppressed in this manner? By invisible and special forces, it contained a report of Admiral Byrd's flight beyond the North Pole in 1947. So the first printing of the magazine completely disappeared, and the second printing did not have this report of Admiral Byrd's flight, which is very strange. So why is the government suppressing things from us? Well, they always have. This is proof right here. Like when I talk about the government suppressing stuff about dogman attacks or 
you know, anything that's strange. And the people outside of the, the norm, because we're normal, we are, um, don't believe it. Well, it happens, you know. Uh, a lot of information out of Virginia has been covered up. A lot of information about the case in Cott County, Tennessee, covered up. It's just, it's, it's crazy that our government does this to better suit their agenda. And in the end, the government will always hide things from us that it wants to be kept secret might not even be our government, the government we know. It may be the secret government, NWO. Who knows? All I know is this is proof that it's been going on for a very long time, 80-something years right here with proof. Admiral Byrd's recorded flight plan just mysteriously covered up and disappeared. And log. Hmm. Go figure, right? Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's second half as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. May the great spirit watch over us all. And may he guide us down that path that we call life. <laughs>